Hello, welcome back to Christie's Virtual Classroom. This video is aimed to explain Lab 4. So this is the student view starting from your home page. Go over here to Modules. We are now on Module 4 here, so we're going to look at Lab 4, Faults and Earthquakes. Okay, so this is broken down into different sections. There's an intro here for you to read, just to kind of refresh your memory on faults and earthquakes. So this first part is the squeeze box experiment. There are videos linked in this lab that you'll need to reference and watch and then complete what it is asking. So this first one is you're going to click on this experiment that will run through Okay, so this portion of the lab, and here it'll show you what happens when um, these layers that are originally horizontal are applied compression. So here we're applying a compression stress, and then you're going to see what happens to the layers. The first thing that you're going to do is draw the layers. So there's a template here for you to use. You don't have to use this exact thing. If you want to draw it on a piece of paper and then just take a photo and upload it, that's fine. You can upload a scan document or you can draw it on the computer in a Word document or something like that. Okay, and then you're going to write down what the initial length and the initial thicknesses are. So you'll click here and you'll click down what your um, thickness is and what your length is. Question three is when we actually apply the compression stress. So you'll watch what happens as you apply the compression. And then you're going to draw the result here or on a separate piece of paper. And then upload the file. After that, you'll write down what layers thickness is and what the uh, length of the layers are after the initial squeeze, the first squeeze. Then we squeeze it one more time. And you'll watch this video to view that. And you're going to write, you're going to draw the layers, upload the file, and then record what the thickness and the final length are. Okay. So, final thickness, final length. Okay. Then you're going to um, answer a couple of questions here. So, what type of faults do you observe? Um, if you listen carefully in the video, you should be able to figure this out. Um, how can you observe faults and folds? What stress was applied to the squeeze box? I just said it a minute ago, so hopefully you get that. And then what type of plate boundary do you think this is similar to? So once you know the stress, that'll help you determine what plate boundary. Remember, divergent plate boundaries are from tension, transform are from shear, and convergent are from compression. Okay, so keep that in mind when you're doing this. Part two is looking at an earthquake machine. So um, each of these are a different fault. So the first fault here is the white wolf fault. So this one has a different um, parameters and that's talked about in this video. This is actually my mom. <laughs> um, we made the videos together. So it'll ask you some questions like what do the winch movements represent? And it gives you three options and they're basically these three, change in brick position and then the change in um, the bungee cord. So this is all talked about in the video, so as long as you pay attention to the video, you should be okay here. Okay, and then after reviewing the demonstration, um, measure the distance the brick moves during each slip movement. So those are listed um, or talked about when you watch the videos, so make sure you're listening carefully. Um, same thing here, you're looking at the scale um, reading, so that's the scale that you see here. Okay. And we're given a lot of uh, leeway here for what numerical answer we're looking for. So as long as you're in the ballpark, you're okay. And then you're recording the number of wench cranks. So that's the cranks that you hear as it's turned at this location here, the bottom right of the screen. Okay, and then you'll do the same thing for the Hollister fault. Same questions, it's just a different fault. And then to sum up part two, you're going to kind of answer these questions and give a summary of what happened in those experiments, what they represented, 
um, what you think might be causing the differences in slip between the two faults. Um, a lot of that is talked about in the video, so as long as you're kind of following along, you should be okay. Part three is the P and S wave analysis. So we're looking at a slinky here, and they're going to do a few different motions. Um, and then the questions are going to ask you about those motions. So the first motion applied is a push motion towards the other student. What do you think that is representing? Um, and then what is which type of wave we're we looking at? A primary, secondary, or body wave? So remember, primary is the P wave. The secondary is the S wave. And the body waves are the love and relay waves, okay? Which are a combination of the primary and secondary. And then it asks you about the second motion. And then we move on to part four, which is the Vibe Sensor app. So if you've already done this lab or you've already looked at it, um, I used to have a bunch of text here about downloading the Vibe Sensor app, but it wasn't working um, very well on the computer. And it's no longer available in the iPhone App Store or the i pad app store so um, don't worry about downloading it i gave you some screenshots here of what it would look like um, if it were working um, so you can use these as reference hopefully you can see these um, for answering the questions that follow okay so this is all raw data so when it refers to the raw data it's just referring to the data that you see above so you'll say which directional variable moved the most in the earthquakes so you can tell that either by looking at these graphs, or this graph, or you can look at this. So the bigger this pi is, the more it moved. Okay, so that can kind of give you an indication of which one moved the most. It'll ask which moved the least. Um, and then what do you think will be the relationship between vibrations recorded by the app and earthquakes recorded by a seismograph? Okay, so this normally would have worked where you put your phone or you have your computer on a table, you shake the table and you get a resulting vibration graph like this. So how does that compare to recording earthquakes? Is it similar to ground motion? Did you need the computer to move in order to get the vibrations to show up? So that's what you'll talk about here in question 25. Part five, you're reading seismographs. So this, these three seismographs are from the Ridgecrest Ridgecrest earthquake that occurred um, last July. So you might have remembered some of these. You might even have um, some videos of things moving if you were fast enough. But um, these are three different seismic stations. Remember on our x-axis is the time and the y-axis is the amplitude. Now the amplitude here is in millimeters. It is cut off. Um, but it is in millimeters, and down here, when you're answering these questions, you do not need to include the unit. So just put the number in these questions. So questions 26 through 35, you're just including the numbers, okay? So don't, don't worry about the units. They have units, but we're not going to worry about it when you enter it into this um, numeric answer box. Okay, so remember to figure out the amplitude, you find the highest point, and then you read off what the graph says over here. Okay, so find the highest point and read it off. I recommend if you have access to a printer to printing this out. If you don't have access to a printer, try to use a ruler or a straight piece of paper to find your peak and read what that amplitude would be. Same thing with finding your arrival time. So remember the P wave arrives first. So on this graph, it would be this point right here. And read what that time is in seconds. Kind of break up this distance. So from 25 to 30, there's five points, right? It's five spaces. So there should be four little lines in here you break up. And try to just estimate as best you can. And then your S wave arrives here where it starts to go up really high. And so just estimate what that would be. And then your lag time is the difference between those two. Remember, the lag time is the difference in arrival between the P wave and the S wave. Okay, so when you're calculating lag time, if it shows up at 26 and 33, it's 33 minus 26. Okay, so you do that for each of the graphs, and you'll put that information in here. Okay, so once you have your lag time and your amplitude, you can start figuring out the magnitude. So here again, if you print it out, it'll be a little bit easier for you, or you can dig a ruler or some sort of straight edge across 
So you're going to take your lag time or your SP interval, plot it here. Your magnitude is then plotted on this chart, and you draw a line connecting them. Okay, so this right hand side on the far left is the SP interval or the lag time, and this one on the far right, this chart is your amplitude. Your magnitude is what you read in the center here. Okay, you should get somewhere between five and six. So if you're not getting between five and six, you might need to ask me for help. Okay, so that's where you're going to put when it asks you what the magnitude of this earthquake is based on the amplitude and lag time of a particular seismograph. That's what you're going to put here. And it's a numeric answer. Don't put your units. Okay. And then in your own words, what is the relationship between magnitude, excuse me, between um, amplitude on the seismograph and the amount of energy released in a particular fault? Um, does what type of forces drive both faults and folds? So make sure you're answering these questions to kind of summarize the lab in, in total. So this isn't just the last portion. This is looking at the lab overall. Okay, so hopefully that helps you out. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks.